For people that don't know, who are you? Where do you fight out of? Uh, my name is Cameron Rouston, and I fight out of City Kickboxing in Auckland, New Zealand. Um, what's it like being working with Eugene and the team at City Kickboxing, and what's been the biggest spike in your style? Uh, training at City Kickboxing, it's, uh, it was a lot harder than what I thought it was going to be. Yeah, we, we train very hard all the time, even when you're not getting ready for a fight. Uh, sparring's quite hard. The volume's a lot higher than I thought it was going to be as well. But I can see why um, why they're so fit over there because they just everyone's always training real hard and always pushing each other. So that's that's one thing. Yeah. Did it take a while for your body to get acclimatized to that? So long. Oh. Like the first, I think the first eight weeks, I lost like four kilos, three or four kilos. I went from like 91 down to 88. I took it took ages for my body to get back up. And like um, since I started my last few fights, I've had there like a lot of people haven't seen me fight for a few years or like a year have said oh you've bulked up a lot more like you can tell that there's a lot more mass in your frame I think that's just training with like the bigger guys over there like the big Samoans, Tongans, Pacific Islanders guys who are like 100 plus kilos because there's we got a lot of guys who are like welterweights and then, then we've got middleweights so the welterweights usually train with the lightweights and then the middleweights there's no with there's only like me and Israel they're only middleweights and then we've got one light heavyweight and then the rest are just heavyweights so we usually just get um, just, just get like putting groups of three or four with the heavyweights. When I got there, I was like, those bigger guys though, they didn't have the cardio, and they still don't have the cardio, because obviously they're a lot heavier. So I'm like, that was one weapon I had over them was cardio. They had the strength, and I'd say technique was about 50-50. Hmm. Um, but when I got there, I was like, okay, if I can hang with them and not get smashed for the first half, and then that'll tire them out, and by the time like the second half of the workout comes through, they'll just be like, absolutely shattered. How's it been training with Izzy and his team? Because yeah, he, he, he'd have his own sort of circle of guys that he, yeah, that he, he keeps, works with. Yeah, the, I thought it would be like when you get over there, you think like all those professional athletes, like you look at someone like Roger Federer who would get up, gets a massage in the morning, goes and writes in like a greatness journal or something and then goes and sits in like an oxygen chamber for two hours. But it was just like, when I got over there, I, was, I thought it was going to be real professional. They're going to have scientists doing everything. But I get over there and he's like, Rolling, if, rolling in from, from I don't know, whatever he was doing the night before. He's got no shoes on. He's wearing old training clothes, shirts with holes in them and stuff. And that's like, that's kind of what a lot of, majority of people like at the gym, they're just like very casual about it. But when it's time for training, they train. But when it's time to like switch off, these. Except he's rolled in in a McLaren. Yeah, he's, he's starting rolling in a McLaren now. And he's got like, he's got maybe, maybe like one or two new pairs of shorts, that's it. <laughs> but I mean like, we had one training session once and his knee was like, He's got, he's got like some knee issues, but like everyone's got niggles. Mm. I had two knee pads on for wrestling and he, he didn't have shoes. He was just wearing like, like cotton Kmart shorts and like a torn up Naruto shirt with a few holes in them. And he's like, he's like, oh, my knee really hurts. He's like, Cam, can I borrow one of your knee pads? I'm like, mate, you're the middleweight champion of the world. And you just made like half a million dollars in your last fight. And you can't even go out and well, buy just, some knee pads. Just put an Insta post out yeah. there, right? Need, need some knee pads, bro. Yeah. <laughs> Shopped off to help me out. Yeah. And I'm like, okay, I guess you got an knee pad. So, so getting back to you what it's like. You never got back, did you? Yeah. No, no, I just haven't done it. got it back. It was one of my crap ones, so I'm like, you can just keep it. So what it's, getting back to what it's like training over there, like, I had the whole, I thought it was going to be like, get over there, everyone, like, they take, like, your piss test, your blood test, they take your heart rate in the morning, you wake up, and it's like super professional. No, it's not like that at it's all. Like, it's like a, more like an old school sort of fight yeah. than that. Yeah, very very old school but I mean we've had people like Dan Hooker's gone and trained a lot in the US and like uh, like Team Elevation he's trained at Team Alpha Male he's trained he's trained all over the place and then like he he said that their strength and conditioning coaches over in the states are like very scientific it's what I thought it would be at City Kickboxing but then I come over to New Zealand and it's like what are we doing for conditioning and we have this old tattered eight weeks out book that's like the bible of strength and conditioning it's like the very first like uh, edition of it, it's like edition one or two, missing like pages, like people have drawn on the faces, like Eugene's son has like gone and drawn on the faces in the book. And you scroll through it like, okay, this is today's workout. Like we don't have a strength and issue coach, we just got a book that we, we look at and we go, okay, week three, day two, what are we up to? Okay, we're doing like shuttle runs today. <laughs> at least there's a program, right? Yeah, that's uh, it. <laughs> but it works, that's the thing. If you do it properly, like to, to the T that it says in the book, it works. So. Let's re review the last six months or so, yeah? 
So April, you're meant to be on one FC. How did the how did you deal with um, what happened after that, and what effect did it have on you and your training? Uh, yeah, that was that was pretty shit because we I put in like a solid eight week camp, and I'd moved over there, and I'm like. I got this one championship, just moved over, so I thought that was going to be pretty good. Because we didn't have any, there weren't any one championship fighters, or one FC fighters in the gym. We had Ev Ting, but he was like in and out from between Bali and like another gym in Auckland. So when I got over there, I was like, okay, sweet, put in a full eight week camp, put in like four weeks of solid training before that. And it was a bit, a bit anticlimactic and a bit depressing when I, when I didn't get in for that. When I got over there and they, uh, they didn't let me through because of a medical thing. Um, so after that, I was, it was Eugene was like, oh, we're not going to let you fight until you can get this sorted. Like, and the other coaches agreed as well. And so then I couldn't see getting to see the specialist till like, uh, I want to say early June, mid June or something. So that was end of April or like middle of April. And then I had all of May and like half of June where I was just kind of floating around. I was like tinkering with whether I want where I wanted to stay there or not and come back. I'm like, Fine. It's only six weeks, so I just stayed there. And in that six weeks, I think all I did was just train. Like I was training twice a day, Monday, Monday to Sunday, every day we just, I just trained twice a day. If it wasn't with the pro team, like I'd message people in the Jiu Jitsu group and be like, are you training Sunday night or Saturday night? And everyone was like, yeah. So I think in a way it was kind of good because I feel like my skill just like went straight up like that. Because there's no consequence, right? Yeah. You can just play. Yeah. I didn't have to focus on conditioning because I, I didn't know if I was going to fight. So all those conditioning workouts I did, which are like, probably 50% of the workouts in the week just became skill work. Mm -hmm. And it was just like, I think my striking and my grappling just went straight up super fast. So let's, let's fast forward a little bit. So we're, we're now in August. Mm -hmm. um, so your comeback fight after getting cleared and, and everything good to go. Did you have any nerves or how, your, how was your feeling for that one? So this was um, August 5th, New Generation. So Craig Jen show against Martin, Martin Torres. Mm. Uh, yeah, after that one, I think I got. I think Craig told me about that one, like literally two days after I got cleared. I think I'm, I I got cleared, and then he just messaged me out of the blue, and he's like, "Hey, I got a show coming up. Do you um do you want to fight?" And I said, "Yeah." And he's like, "If you got anyone in his, because I think he matched up Bo with Theo, and he's like, um, like obviously he brought me over, and then I was like, yeah, yeah. So he brought me over and Bo over, and then we fought. But getting ready for that was kind of like. Uh, I watched the I watched film on Martin and I'm like he's not the middleweight champion of the world he's not like Dan Hooker he's not any of these guys so I was quite confident going in and just tried to push myself as hard as I could in camp because um, like if I can push hard in this camp and show Eugene that I'm willing to work then he's more willing to put time into me so I think it wasn't more so about the fight it was more so about proving it to the guys in the gym that that you're worth the investment yeah, right yeah that I'm that I'm an asset to the training team. It was really good to watch you come back, eh? Mm. Uh, one thing that was really different, you didn't have a huge celebration at the end. Mm. And it seems like, I don't want to say it's matured, but it's just, you're, you've got that workman-like attitude mm. now. How did that come about? Oh, it's just like, I think it was, I got it from just uh, those guys over in New Zealand. Like, they don't really, you watch like Dan, Brad, some of those kickboxes we have. Uh, a lot of our heavyweight boxers are like they don't really celebrate after they win and like even if you watch Eugene's fights he's just like doesn't even smile after the wins he just like claps his hands he's like I did well he's like pats himself on the back but then it's like in my head as well I'm thinking well if you celebrate what are you celebrating because you just want to fight and you're gonna have another one in like two weeks and it's just like there's no there's no real, real reason to celebrate when a guy that you're meant to beat like you're meant to beat him why, why do you need to celebrate? Like it's already, it's already uh, written that you're, that you're already meant to beat him. Yeah, if you, if you work to your capabilities, that it, it, yeah. was, it was written. And funny you should say that, a month later, you're back in Sydney mm. for Luke Pizzuti's show then, so Superfight MMA, against uh, a veteran, Leo Diaz. Mm. Um, how'd you feel about going against actual, an actual Name opponent who's a little bit beyond his prime, but still tough as tough as nails and from a really good fight gym. I thought he was. Uh, I feel like I trained a, a little bit harder for that because I had some momentum from the last one, and I saw that he was training with like Ross Pearson and Jamie, 
And a few of those other guys at Central Coast MMA, they got like, I think they got like one or two middleweights or light heavyweights who are, I'm not sure if they're amateurs or low-level pros, but they're also like, mm. like they scrap at that gym, like they're Central Coast boys, so they scrap hard. So I knew, in, and I watched Leo had a fight in January with Dave Francis, I think, and that went three rounds, and I'm like, fuck, this guy's actually like really tough. Like Dave couldn't finish him until the third round. Like, so I'm like, I gotta be conditioned, because this guy, this will probably go three rounds. And then, so I wasn't, I wouldn't say I was nervous about that fight, because I knew I could just, if I could just outpoint him if I needed to, or out cardio him. But I was more nervous for my training sessions, because I wanted to push harder than I did for the last camp, for the Martin Torres camp. And yeah, so after that, super impressive re naked choke in the first round. You returned again in December, so only a couple months after that, and you won a regional belt. Describe everything that went into that one. So this is Craig Jen's uh, second show for that, that half of the year against uh, Jaden Enod. Yeah. And, and he actually gave you a round. Mm. Mm. That was when, yeah, so Craig, I think Craig had like three or four other guys who he hit up and none of them took it, and then Jaden took it. But um, when I watched film on Jaden, he was quite good, like his MMA fights, like, when I looked at his resume, he had a, like a WBC Muay Thai title and like a, another one in Thailand, he had like 30, 30 odd Muay Thai fights, and I'm like, oh shit, this guy's like quite good. Funny thing, he actually got nominated for a knockout of the year for Muay Thai. Oh shit. <laughs> <laughs> And um, one of my buddies at City Kickboxing, he is quite good at Muay Thai and he's like, he's been around the scene for a long time, been in China and stuff. And he's like, he's like, I know Jaden. He beat, he fought the guy who I last fought. So Charlie, I'm sorry, the guy's name is Mark from City Kickboxing and Mark fought this guy called Charlie. And Charlie beat Mark, but then Jaden beat Charlie. And Mark's really fucking good. He's in glory. He's like, he was meant to fight for the glory world's weight title. So I'm like, fuck. This guy's got some good stand-up men. Like doing the doing the Muay Thai maths, I'm like, okay, one plus one equals two, like this guy's gonna be good. And then we watched film on him and he was like had some good grappling, like two of his MMA fights, he got submission win. I'm like, okay shit, so this is probably gonna go five rounds. So had a full eight week camp for that. Um, a little bit of wear and tear in the camp, but just like pretty standard stuff. Got pushed quite hard as well. And I got to train with Volkanovski and Kai, because they were I think they were like two days after me or something. And so it was Every conditioning workout they did, uh, I got to jump in on that as well. And then it was just like, have Eugene come along and just yell at you as you're, as you're doing the conditioning workout. Or he'd, or you'd ca he'd catch your eye, you catch his, his eye on the air bike, and, he'd, and you know like, he's thinking, why aren't you going to like maximal effort? So you go a little bit harder. But before, before that fight camp started, I thought I was gonna fight on Eternal in, uh, in Melbourne before the UFC. And then that guy pulled out like three days before and I was fucking annoying. I was like two two or three days into a water cut. Did the did the I rolled that Leo Diaz camp into the next one. I took like two days off and then I just rolled that camp into that one. But I think I took more wear and tear damage in that John that eternal fight camp against John than I did for the eight week one. But Did you learn to to steady your load a little bit when you're... Yeah, that's one thing. Load management's a big thing over there. Because you, you've had, what, equivalent to four fight camps in yeah. six months. Mm. That's a lot of fight camps. Mm. But then after that John one, uh, Eternal told me they were going to get me on at the start of November. So uh, as soon as I got back from Melbourne, after you know getting on the Terps with all my friends and stuff and celebrating, I just went straight into another fight camp. And then it was like a week before, the, so I did about three weeks worth of fight camp, and the week before, the promoter was like, mm, I don't think we'll get you anyone. Like, oh, that was the Gold Coast one, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, that was the Gold Coast. So then I took, I think I took like a few days off after that, did nothing, maybe just came in and like did some skill work, and then I just went straight to an eight week camp for, um, for the Jaden fight. But it was good, because it just kept, just kept the engine rolling. You're like, I reckon if I took time off after the John Fraser one, when they're like, no fight, and took like full four weeks off. My body would have healed, but it would have been so much harder to like, to get going again for that eight week camp. You look super impressive against someone that has some really good Muay Thai mm. uh, credentials, yeah? Um, and he was surprising on the ground as well. He looked a little bit slippery, look, looked mm. like he had a nice high guard that was uh, quite attacking. Mm. 
what, what, what went through your head? Like, were you formulating a plan as soon as, as soon as you felt that high guard saying, all right, I'm going to get my hips in and I'm really going to punish this guy? Or? So the week, because Volk and Kai, for their fight, we'd done all the, all the skill work we would have been doing at like the pro session. It's just been for, for pretty much Volk's fight and like Kai's fight. So whatever, like, that's what I had to learn. And then when they left, I still had like two or three days in Auckland before I came over here. And then Eugene ran through high guard before we left. So I got like two or three days in of like drilling high guard from the bottom and drilling it from the top and like how to get through it. So I was like, it was like fresh in my mind. So when, he, when I think Scott or Bo called out watch for the high guard, I was like, oh, no, I don't know, I did this like yesterday. It's like, it's all good. Yeah, you, you look super good there. And then, then you choked him out right at right then, uh, middle of the second round, I think it was. Yeah. It wasn't, wasn't too far away. Um, yeah, you, you touched on it. There was a fight that fought, fell through for Eternal twice now. Mm. It was good to see that you're, you kept that, that momentum going instead of just getting disappointed and mm. sort of in the doldrums about fights falling through. Tell everyone, how hard is it for you to get matched? M middleweight division is already quite shallow in, uh, in, Sydney, in, in Australia and like New Zealand. So I think even if you enter in as an amateur, or sorry, as a pro, for like your debut at middleweight, you're gonna have to fight someone who's already had a fight. You're not gonna get like a perfect, another pro debut matchup. You're gonna have to fight someone who's had, already had maybe like two or three fights as well. Like my pro debut, I fought a guy who had four fights already. Um, so it's already quite hard for low level pros to come in and get fights, but a lot of the times I look at options like fighting welterweights who want to move up and fight, while well, promoters look at that option, or light heavyweights coming down, or myself going up to light heavyweight, like a, that, that John Fraser fight that fell through, he was a light heavyweight, he was going to come down to middleweight as well. But it's very, very difficult, like, it's never, I've got a guy for you, 100% locked in, let's do it, it's always like, oh, i got this guy for you, we'll ask Cam, Cam said yes, oh, the guy's pulled out, or Cam wants to fight, let's, let me, let's see who's out there. We got about eight names and then one out of the eight will take it or two out of, two out of the eight will say yes. And saying that, so Tapology, they got you as 12th in, in Australia and New Zealand. They got terrible rankings. Mm. They've got people there that haven't fought since 2017. There's a couple of really, really tasty rematches up there. Mm. So Izzy. Izzy and Jacob. Yeah, Jacob. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they've been on a tear. Yeah. How much would it mean to you to be able to revenge those sort of um, losses, or at least have an opportunity to fight it, fight again at that? I've talked to Eugene about that. We've talked, and he's like, because I got offered um, Malcoon on uh, Wollongong Wars, but I had that was on three weeks' notice, and Malcoon had already done like a five, had already done five weeks worth of training, so he's doing a full eight-week camp. And I'm like, oh, Eugene, let's take this fight against Mount Coon. Like, it was real close the first time. I think I can take him this time. But it was like, oh, you need an eight-week camp for someone like that because he trains with Whitaker. Like, sure, you've gotten better since that fight, but he's definitely gotten better as well since that fight. And um, I think maybe it's possible in the future if we both keep going the way we're going, maybe meet in, like, the UFC or, like, the fight before you get to the UFC, say, for, like, uh, like an eternal belt or a hex belt or something and definitely get matched up for that. But I think um, that's with Malcolm, but I'm pretty sure Izzy's gonna be going into the UFC, his next fight, which is, maybe I'll meet him in the UFC, we'll see. That'd be the goal, right? Mm. That'd be the goal to bring that sort of a, a local derby somewhere in yeah. Australia if they, if they do yeah. it. Yeah. 2020's here. I'm, I'm sure you haven't thought about it too much, but I'll put you on the spot here. Do you have a medium a uh, short-term, medium and long-term goal for this year? Yeah, so Feb 22nd, Eternals coming to Auckland, the day before the UFC. Um, we're going to push pretty hard to get on that. Um, they owe me a fight, so Eugene Eugene knows that as well. So Eugene's obviously got some pull in the MMA in Auckland. So I think headline or co-main event is definitely a possibility because I can't really see anyone else from the gym who could main event it. I just think there's like one or two other people who could, who could take the main event spot, but I think I could definitely take that maybe against another middleweight from New Zealand or they fly over a middleweight from Australia or possibly even like somewhere like the Philippines or I think there's like there's a few guys in Guam mm. in Guam because that's like a, an American territory so there's a lot of 
there's a lot of MMA fighters over there. Or, and then after that, I'd like to get maybe one in March or April. And then that will be two. And then I want to, this year, I want to get about four fights in, at least four fights, win all four. And that'll put me at what, like 10 and two. And then I know the UFC comes, they always come to Australia at the start of the year. So it's like, or, or New Zealand at the start of the year, and then it's, we've got the connection with Eugene. And it's like, if he thinks I'm ready, we can push and get onto the UFC card. Well, there's definitely massive opportunities there, right? With the mm. champion in New Zealand, a champion in Australia now. There's at least going to be one, one more fight in this South, South Pacific mm. area. But I look at um, a lot of guys from the gym who, from City Kickboxing, have been signed to the UFC and they've only had like, you know, they've, they haven't had as many fights as a lot of other people who get signed. Like Izzy, when he got signed, I think he was 10 and 0. That's a lot of fights. And like someone, like Brad, who I think he was only five and one when he got signed, but Eugene sees it in the gym that he's ready. It's like a lot. Of, you can be five and one. You can sure as hell not be ready to go into the UFC. Mm. But people get pushed in there anyway. There's a few other people from Sydney who are like that, and they just have two fights and they lose. But if you, I think if Eugene and the other coaches see that you're ready, even if you've only had three, four, five fights then you're ready to go in and do it. And Eugene doesn't usually put names out there no, super often. No, so when no he way. does, he makes, they, they yeah, definitely listen. Hey. He makes that you're 100%, make sure that you're 100% ready. Awesome. Now side one, how did the collaboration with um, Labyrinth BJJ come, out, come about? Uh, there's a guy at the gym called Ben Boyce and he's, um, he's a black belt at the gym. He coaches some training there. He's not the professor. But he's uh, he does a lot of coaching, helps out with um, helps out with the pro team a lot as well. Like um, people ask him a lot of questions and help. And I don't know. I think he just we just kind of because I I'm really interested in Shih Tzu and he obviously he likes MMA, but his striking is terrible. So he relies on his grappling and his Jiu Jitsu a lot. And then we just we just kind of clicked and got along as well. He's a little bit of a weirdo and I'm a bit of a weirdo, so we just kind of like. Two positives make a ne two negatives make a positive. I think it's something like that. So we just came together, we're a bit weird together. We started rolling a lot more, started doing like open mats together and stuff. And he actually got me ready for a lot of fights as well. Because I'm like, oh, I think I saw like I watched film like, oh, this guy's got like a good guillotine or a good choke like, and I know you've got like good chokes and good guillotines and good um, good back control. So that's always good with that. And then he just um, he was, he used to have a gym down in. Queenstown, he had a Carlson Gracie's and he sold it and he moved back up to Auckland where I think where his dad was. And on top of his coaching, he just like tried to supplement himself with, with the Jiu Jitsu brand. He just started up like he's doing gis, shirts, shorts, all that stuff. So yeah, it's good. And um, he's, I'm just, I'm just a model for him. <laughs> I'm just, I'm just the ugly model. <laughs> Nick down, it's yeah, Nick down. <laughs> pretty much. How can people get in contact with you? Um, people can get in contact with me through Instagram at Cam Rouston. Uh, so it's C A M R O W S T O N. That's probably the easiest way. Um, Facebook as well, Cameron Rouston. You can shoot me a message there. Uh, it's, sometimes I don't see all the messages that come through. Probably don't email me because I don't look at unless it's like a like a like a, uh, a, a bill or a tax return or just like a receipt. I don't really look at the email. And that's probably the easiest way. Or you can just rock up to City Kickboxing at 9am. And, and I'll be there on the mat. Thank you so much, dude. I look Thanks forward to having a huge 2020 for you. At least a couple of fights back on this side of the ditch mm. anyway. So, latest, man. Thanks, was.